Hello and welcome to the 2021 Southeast Division Start Well event. I'm Sharada Deepak, consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist working at the Berkshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. I'm also the Start Well lead for the Southeast Division and have been organising this event for the last four years. I'm really excited to be hosting this event today and I do hope you find it useful, enjoyable and engaging. I'm sure that you'll all agree that the last two years have been incredibly challenging. All of us in some way or the other have been affected either directly or indirectly by COVID-19. There have been changes to our work and our personal lives, and we have been dealing with constant uncertainty and not knowing whether or not we're ever going to go back to the normal that we knew continues to be stressful. I was particularly struck by accounts from my colleagues and new starters within my team and my place of work, finding it a lot more challenging to get to know their new team and find out more about the working environment or the work culture. We are all still new to the etiquette of socialising online, and I do think it's really important, particularly in this scenario for new consultants, to be, aware, to be aware of how challenging this is and take up all the support that is available to help adapt to their new jobs. It has not always been doom and gloom though, because I also am aware of colleagues who have successfully managed to swap their morning work commute for yoga lessons and dog walks and made the new normal work in their favour. The rapid shift to adapting digital technology in our work and our personal lives has been impressive, as have been the innovation and improvements in the quality of care being provided to our patients and families. Thanks to digital working, there has been more flexibility and improved attendance, particularly in our clinics with the online attendance. Either way, if anything, the Start Well program and in the initiative, I think, is more relevant than ever. And I congratulate you for taking an interest and investing in this event this year. We have also had to adapt to these changes and move the Start Well event online like we did last year. And although there were challenges around not being able to offer the interactive version of peer support and workshops as we would have liked, it also made us really aware of the accessibility needs and requirements of many of the delegates and the advantages of having this event online. We have had a lot of debate within the organizing committee around the format of this year's event and considering that we are still under pandemic restrictions, we are having to hold it online. However, faced with the prospect of having a live event for a day, which would limit the number of speakers, we thought we would go for a webinar version where we are able to have 12 speakers and offer eight hours of CPD. And given how information intensive some of these talks are, we are also offering the opportunity for you to view these videos online in your own time and offer an interactive sessions with the speakers on the day of the event, which is the 13th of October, Wednesday, between 12 noon and 2 p.m. So this would offer the opportunities for you to interact with speakers and have your questions and queries answered. We take feedback for this event really seriously and the future talks and speakers will be based on your feedback. So I'd appreciate it if you're able to be really honest and let us know what you think of the events and speakers. Do also send us your questions and comments after these talks, um, no matter how trivial you may consider they might be. In an ideal world, you might just be in a room and, and shout out your thoughts and have somebody across the room validate your uh, thinking. And even though we wouldn't be able to replicate that exact experience, it would be valuable and helpful to have your thoughts out there so we could pass it on to our speakers. Our contact details have been included in the delegate pack along with the speaker biographies and the abstracts. I would encourage you to look through them before you start going through the modules. And I really look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. This year's program is divided into three modules and broadly based on the main principles of Start Well. We have a fantastic speaker lineup from a range of backgrounds, bringing us the experience and expertise. I'm really grateful for their time and commitment in helping us put this event together. 
Before we go on to the modules, I would like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues who helped me organize this event. Dr. Hassanan Altair, whose contribution to the planning has been invaluable, and the manager of the Southeast Division, Karen Morgan, without whose boundless energy and formidable organizational skills, Start Well 2021 will not have been possible. Thank you very much, both. Welcome to module one of the 2021 Southeast Division Start Well event. This module maps onto the start well principles of using support effectively and making connections. Our first speaker is the current college president, Dr. Adrian James, an approachable and inspiring president who leads by example. A consultant forensic psychiatrist by background, he has held numerous roles and leadership positions both within and outside the college. Workforce well-being is one of his priorities and he has very kindly agreed to speak to us today about his journey and his reflections on the impact of the pandemic on staff. The title of his talk is Medical Leadership in the Current NHS Climate and the Impact of COVID. Over to you, Dr. James. Hello, I'm Adrian James. I'm the president of the Royal College and I'm absolutely delighted to be here presenting at the Start Well, the Time to Shine Southeast Division event. I've done a number of these events over the years and some of them are in, in person and some of them online. And I think the, the Start Well initiative is, is one of the most important and the most innovative of all the things that the, uh, the college does. And it's so important that we help everybody to start their career as a consultant in the, the best way possible because it can it can set a sort of tone for the rest of your career. Uh, I'm actually recording this uh, in the uh, middle of July when it's absolutely sweltering heat and I'm aware that this is going out on the 13th of October so probably everybody's freezing cold by then. So uh, whatever the situation that you're in I hope that you're uh, looking after each other, looking after yourselves particularly as uh, COVID is still such a major issue. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my leadership journey and also about my priorities as president. So I'm the 47th president after winning the election at the start of 2020. I'm now well into my second year. I'm a forensic psychiatrist and frontline clinician and have been for 36 years. I still work at my local uh, hospital. It's a 25 mile uh, cycle, which I very much enjoy. I was in work earlier on uh, this week seeing patients. And I think it's really important that I have that connection with a with a team, other colleagues. I'm a trainer as, as well, so I have a, a CT2 uh, doctor uh, and uh, that I'm seeing patients and actually managing all the issues that all of you have to manage on behalf of patients. So my priorities as president are equity between physical and mental health, championing diversity, supporting the workforce and putting sustainability at the heart of all we do. So in terms of my leadership journey, uh, I, I started early as, as a trainee. I was a graduate of Guy's Hospital Medical School when it was a single medical school in, in those days affiliated to the University of London. And then I did my early training, my was now core training. It was a four year training then after just a year of, of house jobs. And I did that at uh, Guy's and I got interested in medical politics and I became the chair of the Southeast Thames Junior Doctors uh, Committee. So on your patch, and in those days, we had those terrible uh, working hours. I remember my second house job. I was on a one in two on call, you know, working all day, working all night, carrying on the following day and then having a, a an, an evening off the day after every other weekend actually being uh, on on call and it was pretty horrendous and of course it was unsafe for patients. So I got together with another group of junior doctors and my job really was to actually get all the evidence about well-being and the uh, safety effects on patients and that was the argument that we we put forward and so i worked with 
various actually politicians actually I, I remember going to see uh, Frank Dobson and uh, and uh, politicians across the, the spectrum and, and really just educated them about what was going on and some of it seemed almost unbelievable they couldn't actually believe that people worked all day worked all night they worked all day uh, again and that they were actually working they weren't just sleeping and on the basis that they might possibly be called <clears throat> so I did a lot of uh, media I did a lot of uh, in engagement and it, it was a it was a pretty really energizing time and it brought about real change it uh, we reduced the hours of work there were then more uh, places at medical school we increased the number of of doctors and actually increased the out of hours pay because there was no incentive to reduce out of hours work because it was seen as as, as cheap labor to be honest and I remember engaging with seniors in my hospital in those days guys hospital was really innovative because it, there was a doctor who was in charge of, of the hospital in those days it was Cyril Chartner who uh, went on to do amazing things and became medical director of the whole NHS and I remember contacting him uh, slightly sort of quaking I mean he was a, a godlike figure and saying look you know um, Professor Chartner I um, I feel very strongly about this I think there's a real case here and uh, I will be going on and doing media I was on the TV those days my my hair was right out here and uh, I thought that he might say well you can't do that that's you know terrible you should just be cracking on doing your work and in fact he was saying look you know I think you've got a point there do you know what you're talking about and uh, I said well mostly I said you know sometimes it's uh, it, it can be a bit difficult he said well if if you feel strongly about it you've got the evidence base then you do it with my blessing and so I was um, really impressed with that and it is one of the things I think if you engage with seniors around you and make sure they know what you're doing that's always been an important thing and actually you know getting involved with something which is really important the the issue of the day and it was very much in the the medical profession it was the issue of the day it, it can really be you know, quite an exciting thing and if you actually achieve change then that 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 gives you confidence to take on other things so I finished my training I did higher training in Bristol and then down in Devon I then became a consultant in the trust where I, I currently work although it actually wasn't the current trust because it was a community trust and the community trust had a number of community hospitals but the majority of the work that it did was was mental health and it wasn't badged as a mental health trust and I remember looking at the, the all the, the the trust finances and seeing most of it was mental health I looked at the trust board and there was nobody with a mental health background on the trust board so I thought well this just didn't seem to be right we're we're missing out as this has always happened in in mental health and so I I went to see the chief executive I became chair of the uh, of the medical advisory committee and I said look you know Eddie was his name uh, he just doesn't seem right you know we've you know we would be most of the business and we're not represented you you only really contact us if you think there's trouble and so we should be represented on the trust board furthermore it was in the very early days of another transition in how the health service was run PCGs were coming in and they looked like they were going to take over community hospitals I said look you're going to lose that work you need to rebadge yourself as a mental health trust and get you know us on the trust board anyway he really sort of looked at me sort of like sort of daggers and didn't really like that idea at all I was in no uncertain terms told to sort of go back and get on with the with the day job so I wrote a paper and went to see the trust chair and she was much more sympathetic she said look I think you've got a point we'll um, let's let have you met with Eddie about it I said yes but got the old daggers there and she said well let's meet together I met together with them again he was really not keen on the idea so I went to see her afterwards and said look uh, you know what are we going to do this isn't good enough so uh, she said well write a paper write a paper and I'll take it to the trust board which in fact she did now they narrowly voted it down but after that I didn't give up and so I went to see the commissioners and there was something called Jill Morgan who was a, a doctor public health doctor uh, who had been a GP 
and she commissioned a review of mental health services in the whole of, of Devon and as a result of that Devon Partnership, Partnership Trust came about. So again it, it was really important that I took my colleagues with me and part of the plan was to have a system of clinical directorates which would put us as clinicians in charge of the management of the services that we worked in. And initially there was a lot of resistance on that. People were a bit concerned that uh, they'd have to take responsibility for all of this. But in the end, I managed to sort of talk them round. And so we, we put forward these proposals. I had the backing of all the consultants. And so we did develop these clinical directorates and I became the first medical director. So um, be bold. Um, go and see the people in charge, uh, come up with a plan and take your colleagues with you. Really in, in, important. So um, it's very hot here. I'm just going to have to mop my brow. Um, say when this goes out, it's probably be hard to believe. But so I was very proud to be the first medical director of the trust. And uh, this was something I thought, you know, this was like a calling. And, uh, and I set up all the clinical governance arrangements employed lots of new medical managers and it was a very is an energizing time but the chief executive who then was appointed turned out to be a rather bullying person and actually i confronted them uh, about this and and i had other members of the trust board coming in sometimes in tears saying look there's terrible things going on we're being sort of divide and rule some people to be honest were being humiliated and um, it was really quite, I, I, I'd never really come across bullying, I have to say, before, and I saw it writ large. And I had several goes at, um, at uh, raising this in a, you know, a gentle way, then a more assertive way. I went to see various people. I formed good relationships with commissioners, partly because of the work that I'd done in forming the trust. And they were, you know, largely supportive, but didn't feel there was anything they could directly do. And so it all came to a head. I, I went on leave and had had a chat with them, the chief executive beforehand. I came back and there was literally a deputation of the other members of the trust board coming to see me when I got back and I thought, well, this is, you know, nothing's going to change. So I went to see the chief executive and really had one of those. Um, it's either you or me uh, pause for a little bit. And I didn't think that uh, she was going to resign so I said look I'm, I'm afraid I, I really can't work in this environment anymore and so um, I'm resigning I'm getting out and it was a terrible thing to have to do because it was something that I I love doing and I would you know it was very much a part of me and in some ways it was a devastating thing and quite risky really I still was going to be working in the in the trust and I very much uh, made my position clear with the most powerful person in the trust but I think sometimes you do need to actually walk away from work and try again do something do something different and 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 not feel that it's it's a devastating thing to do there are always new opportunities if you keep at things and I think one of my other pieces of advice is keep a number of strings to your bow and I'd already been involved quite a lot with college work and so I left the medical director post. I went back just to being a clinician, although I later became the clinical director of the service. And but I, I took an increasing role within the college. I thought, well, I'm I've, I've got to plough a different sort of furrow. So no one to get out, but keep your options open. Keep many things going in parallel so that if one thing doesn't work out, you've got other things you can latch on to. So I then became the head of school and set up the, the School of Psychiatry in the southwest of England. And again, this was a real energising time. It was an opportunity for us. We, you know, we had a, a, a mental health school. There was a physical health, phys you know, medicine school, a surgical school. I worked with the other heads of, of school. We grew the number of places in the southwest. Our recruitment actually was 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 very good. And it was really it was all about the trainees and the trainees are the future of, uh, of psychiatry and thankfully now we've got 100 percent recruitment and a growing number of training posts and uh, have expanded uh, throughout the whole of the the uk so never forget the trainees never forget 
the, the the people who are coming after you. And actually, there was an, an old sort of adage that uh, um, be be nice to people on your way up. Uh, you might need them on your way down. And uh, I think uh, that's absolutely right. Always be uh, be nice and courteous uh, to people. That's really important. So then I became chair of the Southwest Division. I was very proud uh, to be elected. And we were very innovative. In fact, we were, I think, a while we were known as the People's Republic of the Southwest Division of the Royal College. And we, we were quite a long way from the college centrally. People talk to me now about how the college is centred in, in, in London. And I've been in London. I know the value of that. And I've worked distant from London. And certainly there was that perception things were going on at the college that it was difficult for people to access. And of course, now with all the, the online offer, it, it's all much more accessible. So we set up a lot of training courses and people really liked them. They, they, they came, they liked mixing, they liked the socialising and they liked not having to go hundreds of miles to access courses. And we developed really high quality courses and so they were very popular and that again is my uh, I think one of my pieces of advice is that if you develop high quality products people will always want to access them and don't hesitate to spend money on them I mean don't be reckless but uh, we had very good speakers uh, we had good venues and we 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 actually made quite a lot of money and we spent that money on projects. We were the first division to employ uh, service users to have them actually on our executive and we did a number of innovative things. Uh, a free conference, for example, on commissioning mental health services. It was always been my ambition to bring psychiatrists not only close to the people managing them, preferably they should be psychiatrists managing psychiatrists, uh, right through the organisation and we've got a number of excellent uh, med medical directors uh, and chief executives who are psychiatrists so it, it's it's always a career path where you should you should think about and so we should be close to them but we should be close to commissioners and so we got all the commissioners who are commissioning mental health services in the southwest together in the room with the chief executive of the regional health authority and talking about what our views were about what should happen and so it's um it, and and it actually did lead i think to to real change and real engagement and we developed relationships with people who were really important to us and again as we move into a, a world where we've got integrated care systems see it as for for uh, as a responsibility for all of you to engage with your commissioners and you'll be surprised about how beneficial that can be. Commissioners often, they really want advice. They they want to be able to reach out to people that they know. So make um, make contact with them because what they commission, is they're the services that your patients will be admitted to or they'll be worked with within the community that setting and there'll be those services that you'll be working in. So it's time well spent. So what about managing and looking after your yourself. I, I think it's it's always good at every part of your career to have your own self management plan and it'll be different for for everyone. None of us will ever get that right. It's all very easy, isn't it, to say, well, have lots of breaks and keep your boundaries and it's very difficult to do that. But you have to have something that uh, that works for you and the sorts of things that I've developed over the years. Uh, actually, cycling to work has been really important because it's a very clear boundary. You you get a bit of exercise, you get some fresh air and if you don't concentrate on what you're doing, it's uh, it's very hazardous, so you you have to focus on what you're doing, and it gives a break between everything that I'm doing at home and everything I'm doing at work. Uh, forming good relationships with your your colleagues, making sure that you meet with them uh, on a a regular basis. You put some real time into that. Making sure that you do have time for friends, family, loved ones. That you you do make sure that you take all of your leave or most of your leave. That you get a a proper break when you're doing that. That's been very difficult in uh, in COVID, 
but th those are the sorts of things that have really worked for me. I also always got involved in village activities and again something that really takes you away. You have to concentrate on something different, but all everybody's plan will be be different. But um, but of course that can't always uh, work and no, no plan is is perfect and actually in my uh, uh, mid 40s I developed depression and I'd never had a day's mental illness in my life and I suddenly found that I was um, I wasn't sleeping. I was waking up at night, cold sweats. I was having funny dreams. I my confidence had gone. I began to think I hadn't achieved anything. Got worse and worse. I thought well, the people around me don't need me, and uh, I've you know they'd be better off without me. And I was also training for a, a a cycle event, and I lost a lot of weight through that on purpose. And but I found that actually once the event was over, I'd normally my weight would go back on, and it didn't go back on. So that was a bit odd. And I went to see my GP and said, look, I maybe I've got something physically wrong, but I, I can't think I've actually developed a mental illness. I, I think I'm probably depressed. And he actually turned to me. It was, it was quite sort of funny in a way. He was really very good actually, but it, it was it was to the effect. Say, well, look, you're head of the Royal College in the southwest of. England, you you can't be depressed. I said, well, of course I be depressed. I'm a psychiatrist, doesn't rule rule me out. And um, and so they did a few tests, did the usual rule out the physical side first, and then it got worse and worse. And actually, I found myself sitting in my office once, and I could feel tears coming into my eyes. And actually, I went into a colleague's office. Fortunately, was in the next room, and I I. I said to her, look, you know, you've got to get me out of here. Actually, I'm depressed and um, I can feel I'm starting to cry. And also I'm at work. That's obviously not right. So I then went straight back into my GP the following day and said, put me on antidepressants. I I really need to um, to get some treatment here. I, I really am depressed, even if there's other physical stuff going on. I was on antidepressants for about nine months and I was off work for six weeks. I went back probably slightly too early as we all do and but it was um it was a it was a very um a traumatic humbling experience i had another episode two years later and again i was back on antidepressants then made a recovery and i'm i think about 15 years since actually i, I had that last episode but it um I, I think if i'm absolutely honest i probably was somebody beforehand who did think that mental illness happened to other people uh, interestingly, I did have a very strong family uh, history, um, particularly on my father's side. But when I decided, again, the usual that I was going to be a psychiatrist, I was the first uh, person in my family, extended family, to become a doctor. Um, the reaction of my parents was, you know, you, you, you know, why are you wasting your career, all that effort to get in, and you're going to become a psychiatrist? And it was very interesting that later on I discovered that there were so many people with a mental illness in my family. I'm thinking, well, wouldn't you, wouldn't you want the best? I mean, they, you know, they love me dearly and uh, were very proud. You know, wouldn't you want the best to be treating people in that in the most, most vulnerable uh, situation in in life, having a mental illness, and the the complexity. Uh, uh, but also the richness of, of what we um, what we do and wouldn't you want the best to be be doing it in fact by the end they uh, were very proud and could see that I'd, I'd made a good career and made a real difference and it opened up all sorts of discussions about mental illness in our our family I mean, sadly they didn't get to see me become president of the uh, of the college um, so it's um, so look after yourselves look after each other it's really important you can't just go hell for leather the whole of your your life. You have to have a plan to manage what you're doing and manage uh, yourself and create a supportive group of people around you so that if you do need to get out of a situation as I did, you've got people that you can go to that you you trust. And I was very open with my consultant colleagues about having, you know, I was off with mental illness and although my GP again wanted to put on the the my sick note uh, stress at work and I said well I you know everybody's stressed at work can't they you can put that on anything I said I you know I, actually I think you should put depression he said well could have consequences you know and I said well you know it is you know this is what it is and um, 
so um and it didn't actually my trust were actually were very very supportive the, the chief executive i had the real running had gone there was a, in the end there was an inquiry by the what what is now called the care quality commission it was then the health care commission and um they were ousted in fact um, for bullying so it's uh, so there was a much more supportive environment then and they were all very good to me so look after yourselves and your colleagues so then I became the chair of the Westminster Parliamentary Committee and again that really got me into public mental health I mean dealing with uh, politics politicians ministers is, is really about populations rather than in individuals although individuals grouped together to become populations so in the end it does come down to individuals and I worked with the big mental health charities and one of the things I did was I met with all of them and so well, look, we've it's no good if we all go in arguing for different things and we need to agree what we can agree on and all go in arguing for those things and then politicians have got nowhere to go and so with mind rethink the center for mental health the uh, the um nhs confederation mental health network we we worked very closely together we agreed on the sort of the killer facts the one in four of us having a, a mental illness at some point, the 15 to 20 year lost years for those with with SMI, the treatment gap, which was then only a quarter of people would get to who had a mental illness would get evidence based treatments is now gone up to a third. So and it became, you know, we, we, we would all go in together arguing the same thing. And I'd, I'd like to think that that contributed to some of the extra investment that that went in we also argued about well if you do invest this is what you get there was good evidence around what was happening with liaison services that have been uh, transformed have con continued to be transformed in my lifetime so it's um it, it's I, I would encourage you to engage with your local mp your local MP can't refuse to see you and it's uh, if you write to your MP you might get a, just a standard letter back if you go and see them and you've got uh, something that you really want to see them about at the moment we've got the comprehensive spending review which is in the autumn of this year will will come about and that's where you have the investment in workforce and buildings and that sort of thing and so we're hoping there'll be a three-year settlement and there'll be a good one for mental health so go and see your MP about investing in mental health services and why it's so important. So then uh, I was elected as the uh, registrar and we when I started the we had a, a very small uh, communications and policy team. They were an amazing group of people and they did some fantastic work, but we weren't really a campaigning organisation at that point. And so myself and some of the senior members of the, the college really sat down and said, well, you know, do we want to become more of a campaigning organisation? And furthermore, with our policy work, do we want it to become more focused, focused on not just producing stuff that was worthy stuff, but which might sit on a shelf, but something that we had a very clear plan as to what we were going to do with it. So it brought about real change. So in fact, we we really redesigned the communications and policy department at the college and it, it has been transformed. It's now much bigger. We appointed a former BBC journalist, Kim Catcherside, and uh, I remember sitting at the interview and saying, well, she was obviously somebody who's going to completely change our approach. Yeah, this was a bit risky. What, did we really want to do it? And there were still college members who think that we, we're too campaigning, that we should just be about training and education. But in our world where our services are so far short of where they should be, it's really important to to get out there and actually have to argue for more money for look at what's happened in terms of our choose psychiatry campaign and working with with all of you to promote the great career that psychiatry is and we've now got 100 percent recruitment and we've had an increase in the number of, of of places so we can grow that uh, now but that that was campaigning really that was a, a major part uh, for that so sometimes when you start a new job you do have to look at those around you and say is the structure fit for purpose? Is the strategy right? Are the people around me? Do we need to get some new people in with new ideas and new capabilities? And sometimes you you have to it's, that can be quite painful, but you, you have to have your eye on the big picture and what you actually want to achieve. And that brings me pretty well up to the present day when just over a year ago, 
it was my great honour to be elected the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And my priorities are workforce well-being, diversity, uh, equity between physical and mental health and sustainability. So in terms of equity between physical and mental health, you've all done a fantastic job in providing the services that you can for the patients that you serve. And we've had huge developments and investment in recent years in branches of psychiatry like liaison psychiatry, some aspects of child and adolescent psychiatry, for example, going into schools and most recently perinatal psychiatry and now welcome investment in general adult psychiatry. But there are huge gaps and we know that only one in three people who could benefit from evidence based treatments actually get those treatments. And of course, COVID has thrown this uh, into the, the absolute spotlight when the demand for mental health services has gone up record numbers of contacts, record numbers of people who are accessing services uh, through acute and emergency routes and a huge increase in referrals for eating disorder. So it's been my job uh, throughout the pandemic to work with our leaders, uh, new uh, health secretary, I've not met him yet, um, but uh, he has already said that uh, he wants a new plan for, for mental health. Uh, Claire Murdoch, uh, who leads for mental health at NHS England, and of course Chris Whitty, probably the most powerful doctor in the land, interested in mental health. I met him individually and many, many times with the other presidents of the Royal Colleges. So we've had to argue for things like the, the vaccination strategy to take regard of the increased risk of those with uh, severe mental illness. And we managed to get uh, SMI into cohort six. So my second priority, putting sustainability at the heart of all we do, and we published our position statement. I'm delighted with it. And of course, uh, this autumn we have a COP26 coming to Glasgow, and so there could never be uh, a better time to concentrate on this. And we now know there's increasing evidence that climate change has a direct impact on mental health not only in parts of the world where you have forced migration, which is a, a huge cause of mental illness, but we now, now know, for example, with particular emissions that they can have an, a direct effect on, on mental illness, cause things like dementia and also depression. But the evidence is, is growing as well as as a mental health service. We need to play our part because we have a huge uh, um, carbon footprint and of course, uh, greed and uh, uh, eco-friendly ways of operating and running our services are, are often better for our patients in terms of their recovery. So I commend our statement to you. So supporting the workforce, my third priority. Of course, COVID again has sh shone a light on the workforce, the, the value of the workforce. But of course, many of you have been working at the, at the front line and things have been very busy and often traumatic. You may well have lost somebody very close to you. You may have lost a colleague uh, or a, a, a friend or member of your family or a patient. And our, our survey showed that 48.6% of 1,369 members who did our survey uh, confirmed that their well-being had either suffered or had significantly suffered as a result of COVID-19 and the uh, lockdown. So we published our workforce strategy to ensure the UK has a highly skilled mental health workforce. We've got the comprehensive spending review coming up when we hope we'll get additional investment. We have our psychiatrist support service and again we provided uh, an increased level of service throughout the pandemic. We've continued to update our guidance for clinicians on a whole range of uh, issues to do with COVID and our going for growth plan, our, our staff recovery plan post COVID uh, has been published and we're working with NHS England to ensure that the, the mental health hubs, for example, that they're fully funded and that they work well as part of a, a, a joined up system. If you look at the workforce, the number of psychiatrists, they've creeped up over the last 10 years. We know we need many, many more. Uh, but now I think things are beginning to accelerate and we've had that extra investment in core training because we, we, we were able to fill our existing posts. 
So my next priority is championing diversity and the world, of course, was absolutely shocked and appalled by the tragic murder of George Floyd. And COVID also showed the differential impact that um, people from diverse backgrounds suffered as a result of, of COVID. And we know that uh, patients from diverse backgrounds find it more difficult to access services. They have poor experience and poorer outcomes. And we know that staff from diverse backgrounds, many of you had to have to work twice as hard to get to where you are. And it's uh, that's not right. And if we don't help every single member of staff to su support them to get to where they want to get within an organisation, the whole organisation loses out. Say nothing that it's the moral thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It sends the right messages to our staff that they are supported and they're valued and that we're right behind them. So I pointed to uh, race equality leads, uh, Lavi Smith and Raj Mohan, and they've done a great job in pulling together our equality action plan. We launched this on the 14th of January. We had a series of four roundtable discussions to say what in the, the current time, what are the priorities? What do we want to achieve? But we also looked back on 29 previous reports along with their recommendations because the history of this issue is that very often people publish a report, they've got recommendations, they implement one or two and the rest just sit to one side and people never get round to them. So we didn't want to lose that valuable learning and the actions that came from them. So we, as part of this, want to encourage more women into leadership positions. We had our first female president in 1939, Dr. Helen Boyle, who uh, we have recognised that with a, a, a picture which you see at the top of the, the stairs in the, in the college. Our first two chief executives were women. Were women. And among our 19,000 members, 45% of, of uh, people are, are female and 55% are male. 42% of those involved in our committees are female. And so there, there are a whole a variety of ways in which uh, we don't value women, we don't support them, we don't make sure that they can get to wherever they want to be within the organisation. And again, the organisation loses out as a result. So what are the key challenges? Women doctors can be overlooked and underpaid, they can be patronised and judged on their appearance. Uh, inequalities uh, can exist because of working less than full time. Uh, clinical excellence awards, again, the number of women applying is less and the number of women actually getting clinical excellence awards, again, is uh, is down in terms of their proportion of the, the workforce. And feedback from our members has shown that the college has not always felt to them like an inclusive and welcoming institution. So, we have a women and mental health special interest uh, group and we're, we're working with them to improve the mental health of, of women uh, everywhere, but also the, the status of women within the profession. And it was a fantastic uh, project earlier on this year, the 25 Women Project, high, highlighting the stories of 25 amazing women psychiatrists. And we have blog posts, podcasts and a short film. And it's uh, if you haven't seen it, it's on the college website. I really, uh, really recommend it. So that's uh, all I really wanted to say. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm so pleased that you're at the Startwell event and I hope that you have a long successful career and that you look to the college for support, but also that you look to take on a college position, uh, for example, and really work with the college to do what we can to improve the services and experience and outcome for our patients. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next topic is college and division support for new consultants. Next up, we have Paul Rees, the Chief Executive Officer of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, who can rightfully take credit for the modern and forward thinking college that we currently are. Paul has been vocal about the college's inclusion and diversity policies, and I'm very pleased that he will be speaking to us about the college support available for new consultants. Followed by Paul, we have 
Dr. Hassanan Altair, a forensic psychiatrist by background and previous vice chair of the Southeast Division. He will be speaking to us about the College Division Executive Committee and the various opportunities available within the division for new consultants. Hello, it's great to see you all at this Southeast Division Start Well event. My name is Paul Rees and I'm the Chief Executive of the RC Psych. Now today is a very important day for us, as it's the day when we get to talk to new consultant psychiatrists from across the Southeast about the college and what support we can provide. Now, as you may know, the RC Psych is a values based organisation and our values of courage, innovation, respect, collaboration, learning and excellence are central to everything we do. We promote the value of courage because we need to be courageous in promoting the benefits of psychiatry, as historically the specialty has sometimes been seen as a lesser form of medicine due to the stigma around mental health. We promote the value of innovation because medical royal colleges can be traditional and conservative with a small c, but the world out there is changing fast and we want to encourage our members and our staff team to think continuously about how to do things differently and better. We promote respect because with a diverse membership and workforce, we want everyone to be respectful of other people, regardless of their characteristics or backgrounds. We promote collaboration because traditionally the 13 specialties and subspecialties of psychiatry and the eight college departments have operated as separate silos, with some departments being referred to as the other organisations and we want everyone to work together as one college. We promote learning because we want to be a continuously improving organisation and learn from things that go wrong as well as from things that go right so that we don't repeat the same mistakes and instead look to consolidate successful new ways of working. And finally, we promote excellence because the emphasis in previous eras has been on doing things the college way but we want to prioritise delivering excellence in membership and staff experience. Under our value of respect, we've started to mark major diversity celebrations as key dates on the college calendar. The RC site is a very diverse organisation. 46% of our members are women, 39% of our members are black, Asian and minority ethnic. And according to our recent membership survey, up to 18% are LGBTQ+. So it's important that we promote equality, diversity and inclusion. Since we introduced our values back in 2018, we started to majorly celebrate Pride, Black History Month, International Women's Day and South Asian History Month. We've introduced a speaker diversity policy to make sure that the rosters of speakers at college events represent the full diversity of our membership. And we started to take more courageous decisions around equality, diversity and inclusion. Now, when George Floyd was tragically murdered last May, we were the first medical royal college to issue a statement condemning all forms of racism. This statement went down exceedingly well with our members, with one senior member tweeting to say that statement alone has made 35 years of membership fees worth it. Our president, Dr. Adrian James, has made equality, diversity and inclusion one of his presidential priorities, along with parity of esteem, sustainability and workforce well-being. As a result of our values, we last year divested from fossil fuels and moved all of our investments into a green and ethical portfolio, which is in line with the UN Sustainable Investment Goals. And when we published our new strategy called Excellent Patient Care in a Changing World back in January this year, we amended our vision statement so it reflects where we are as an organisation today. And it says our vision is of a strong and progressive college that opposes all forms of discrimination and helps its members to deliver high quality, person-centred care for people of all ages around the world. As a college, we also have a mission statement. This says, we work to secure the best outcomes for people with mental illness, intellectual disabilities, and developmental disorders by promoting excellent mental health services, supporting the prevention of mental illness, training outstanding psychiatrists, promoting quality and research, setting standards, and being the voice of psychiatry. Now, as well as our four presidential priorities, we also have seven core objectives. These are supporting members through COVID-19 and beyond, 
delivering education, training and research in psychiatry, promoting recruitment and retention in psychiatry, improving standards and quality across psychiatry and wider mental health services, and supporting the prevention of mental illness. Being the voice of psychiatry, supporting psychiatrists to achieve their professional potential by providing an excellent member experience and ensuring effective management of college resources and delivering excellent employee experience. All of these goals are central to our work, but if we were to sum up our purpose in one sentence, it would be to help ensure great patient care. And it's our belief that the highest standards of patient care are delivered by highly trained and well-prepared doctors who, when leaving training and entering the consultant career pathway, are well supported and informed about the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. So how do we support doctors entering the consultant career pathway to be well supported and informed? Well, first we run the Start Well initiative, which focuses on six elements, enabling newly qualified consultants to make connections, ensuring continuous learning, empowering newly qualified consultants to identify the support they need, helping newly qualified consultants to develop personal resilience, enabling consultants to show clinical and medical leadership and empowering newly qualified consultants to develop a meaningful career. So how do we promote these themes? Well, first, we encourage our newly qualified consultants to make connections through the college's committees. We now have 19,300 members and around 1,500 of them are actively involved in our 200 plus committees. These committees include our divisions, such as our Southeast Division, our faculties and special interest groups. And we would encourage you to be as active as you can be in as many faculties and special interest groups as possible. For more information about our committees, please visit the college website. Now, of course, like everything else across the world, the way the college works has been turned on its head since the onset of the pandemic. And as with all our activities, the committees of the college have been migrated online with all college meetings now taking place via Microsoft Teams or Zoom. In the pre-COVID world, we would have thousands of members regularly attending our face-to-face -face courses and events up and down the country, such as our annual International Congress, which in 2019 had 3,400 physical attendees at the Excel in central London. But all of our events have long since migrated online. And since the start of the first lockdown, we've had an incredible aggregate of well over 100,000 live and on-demand member views. Last month, as a result of the pandemic, we also held our first ever digital International Congress. And amazingly, we had another 3,400 delegates, just like we had in London two years ago. The feedback from our members about the online Congress has been exceptionally positive, both about the content and about the digital Congress platform, which gave people a real sense of being at a conference, despite their taking part from a computer. Now, overall, since becoming a virtual organisation back in March 2020, our online conferences, courses and events have seen a 100% increase in member engagement. As making our meetings virtual has allowed people to take part in college activity without having to travel to a particular venue at a particular time. And if you would like to learn more about our full range of webinars and events, please go to our website where you can sign up for forthcoming events and also view webinars that have already taken place. Now, also during the pandemic, we digitised our exam so that foundation doctors can still progress to national recruitment by taking exams in their own homes or at an exam centre and comply with the requirements around social distancing. Over the last year, 4,000 candidates have taken our clinical exam and our paper A and paper B written exams. We were only the second medical Royal college to successfully digitise our exam and last year we delivered the biggest online clinical exam of all the colleges. The project to digitise the exam, which took place over just five months flat, was one of the greatest challenges in the history of the RC Psych. And our president, Adrian James, and former president, Professor uh, Wendy Byrne, have both said they think it was one of the biggest achievements in our history. There were, of course, one or two teething issues when we first rolled out the digital cask back in September 2020. But we've actively sought feedback from candidates and examiners and made changes to the way the exam is delivered. 
with the satisfaction rating from candidates and examiners now consistently being very positive. With the relaxation of lockdown restrictions in the UK, we need to decide as a college how we want to run our activities and services in the future. Now, we could, of course, remain a purely digital college as we are now. We could also go back to being a face to face college like we used to be up until March 2020. Or we could take a blended approach, delivering some services via purely digital platforms, some services via purely face to face means and delivering some services via a combination of the two. And that is exactly the approach we've decided to take from next year. Now, by having a blended model, will enable our members to have the best of both worlds, will enable our members to choose how they want to engage with the college, and at the same time, will drive down travel and carbon emissions. In 2019, the last year before the pandemic, the college generated an incredible 3.7 million miles of travel. In 2020, this was down to 800,000 miles, and this year, it's down to just 1,000 miles. Now, under our blended model, we hope to halve the travel we generate compared to the pre-COVID era, and therefore our carbon emissions should be down by at least 50% long term. Now, as well as courses and events, the college also provides hundreds of CPD online e-learning modules. Last year, we provided 231 CPD online modules, 155 CPD online podcasts, and 58 trainees online modules. In addition, we published learned books and journals such as the British Journal of Psychiatry, which is ranked as the sixth most impactful psychiatry publication in the world out of 143 publications. The college wants to ensure that newly qualified consultants get the support they need within mental health services. And we work collaboratively with trusts to ensure they appoint consultants to realistic and achievable roles. And as such, we ensure their job descriptions are assessed objectively by our regional advisors. We're also working hard to grow the consultant psychiatric workforce in order to ensure there are enough qualified psychiatrists to do the job. Therefore, since September 2017, we've been running a highly successful Choose Psychiatry campaign. Our campaign, which is based around a video that is meant to be our equivalent of the John Lewis Christmas advert, but for psychiatry, has had impressive results. When the campaign was launched four years ago, the fill rate for training places in psychiatry was stubbornly stuck at around about 60%. In 2018, after one year of the campaign, the fill rate increased to 85%. In 2019, fill rates were up to 92%. And last year, they reached an all time record high of 100% across England, Scotland and Wales. The college also campaigns to ensure that there are enough support staff to work with psychiatrists and other mental health workers so that the multidisciplinary team has got enough capacity to deliver excellent patient care. As a result of this, we're working with Health Education England, whose new chief executive is RC site member Navina Evans, to ensure that there is a massive expansion in the number of physicians associates with the college recently launching its PAs at the RC Psych scheme. Given the many challenges of work as a new consultant, it is possible that you may end up at some stage having some uh, personal difficulty at work. Hopefully you won't, but if you do, the college will always be there to support you. If you have any workplace worries from managing workplace stress to difficult working relationships, you can contact the college's psychiatrist support service or PSS on a confidential basis. On average, anywhere up to 100 members receive ongoing support from the PSS each year and hundreds more access the PSS advice uh, on the college's web pages. Unsurprisingly, given the many issues that have been thrown up by the pandemic, these pages have been some of our most visited on our site since the first lockdown. Working in medicine can be tough these days and it's important that psychiatrists empower to develop workplace resilience. The College has a wellbeing committee chaired by Dr. Mahela Bakur, which among other things has come up with an insertion into job descriptions to ensure that consultants on new contracts are aware of the support networks in their areas. We also run resilience and wellbeing courses for members. The College also strives to enable consultants to show clinical and medical leadership in mental health services, which of course will ultimately mean better care for patients. This work is led by the Leadership and Management Committee 
which is chaired by Dr. Helen Krimlisk. The Leadership and Management Committee vision is for all psychiatrists to lead and manage mental health and learning disability services for the best outcomes of the people who use them. We work with the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management and the NHS Leadership Academy and a range of other providers to ensure that our members can get training and support on leadership and management skills and knowledge. Now, the final aspect of the Startwell scheme is empowering newly qualified consultants to develop a meaningful career as they continue their journey as a psychiatrist. Throughout the various stages of their careers, psychiatrists can take on influential and important roles within the college. Persuading trust to free up clinical time for college engagement has become more challenging over the years due to austerity within the NHS. However, the relationship between the college and the mental health trusts is currently in a very good place. In 2019, we held our first ever event for mental health trust chief execs and medical directors, with most trusts being represented. Among the speakers were former NHS England chief executive Sir Simon Stevens. And last month, we held our second such meeting with medical directors online, at which our president, uh, Adrian James, talked about the importance of taking a values-based approach across organisations. Now, we hope to keep up this momentum despite the many challenges of the pandemic. As you continue through the various stages of your career, you can engage with us to influence our work and ensure you have your say. During your time as a member, you could consider becoming a regional advisor to help the college with approving job descriptions, a college assessor and sit on appointment advisory committees for trusts. You could be a regional representative or an examiner and work with us on our exciting new digital exam. You could chair a college committee. You could stand for election and become an officer of the college, such as being the registrar, dean or the treasurer. Or you could land the biggest role of all and become the president of the RC Psych the leader of the profession. The college stands ready to help you throughout your career, and we hope that you will find working with the RC Psych engaging, supportive and fun. Thank you very much for listening. Hello and welcome to the uh, Startwell event of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I'm Hassan al tayyar I'm a forensic psychiatrist and I'm also the vice chair of the Southeastern Division. I've been involved in organizing the Startwell event since 2018. Welcome today. So today I'll tell you about what we offer in the division for new consultants and also we provide support to all grades of doctors, including SAS doctors and other grades who aspire to become consultants. Uh, each division has uh, its own executive committee. So uh, the division is chaired by the chair and then the vice chair and then elected members. The elected members uh, include, well, in addition to that, we have the PTC reps, the psychiatric trainees committee representative, in addition to a service user and a care rep, uh, plus the co-opted members and also the appointed members. All of this structure is managed by the divisional manager. I hope this makes sense. So elected members, what's the difference between elected members and the appointed members? Elected members will have voting rights and these are the chair, the vice chair, the financial officer of the division, the ETC, the Education and Training Committee representative, and the elected member with a speciality uh, subject, like uh, the uh, divisional commissioning representative, the service user and carer uh, contact. And also the speciality doctor, the SAS committee representative. So we have the appointed members, and these are the regional advisors, the deputy regional advisors, the regional speci speciality representative, in addition to the deputy regional representative, the start well lead, the mentoring lead, the choose secretary lead, the newsletter editor, and the academic secretary, in addition to the PTC representative. So these are all appointed divisional members. Moving on to the co-opted members. So these are the college trust representative, the retired doctor's representative, the innovation lead, 
the head of school psychiatry of psychiatry or deanery representative, the policy public affairs committee rep and the leadership and management committee representative. Uh, we also have a variety of college roles. So in each division, there are a number of roles you could be uh, applying for, depending on the vacancies available in your division and your interest, of course. So like the college assessor, this is nominated by the chair of the division, head of faculty or the regional advisor. And you should have a substantive post in your trust for the last three years. And usually the final approval of this post is by the uh, Education and Training Committee. So the college assessor usually sits on the medical uh, appointments or the, the medical recruitment panels as a college representative. It's a very interesting role and I have done it. The regional and deputy regional advisor. So all psychiatrists who have been a consultant or a speciality or a specialist uh, the grade, they should be at least uh, in post for three or more years to be eligible to apply, and they need to be nominated by the chair of the division. And usually the final approval or ratification is by the ETC rep. The regional and the deputy regional representative, so all apply to all psychiatrists who've been at the consultant or specialist associate grade for two years, one year with the agreement uh, of the relevant regional advisor, or more to apply for this post. And you need two references from the Royal College members who have worked with you in the last year, uh, nominated by the regional advisor and approved by the chair of the division and uh, also the head of the faculty. And the final ratification is by the ETC. Uh, this is an interesting opportunity as well. So the CSER pathway evaluators, and you could always contact the division or the CSER scheme to uh, have better or more information about this role. You could also apply for external advisors for ARCP panels and quality visits. And you can always look uh, on the website, work in psychiatry for members, and the link is below. So what do we do, uh, offer in the division for members? Um, a number of, of activities, a number of uh, initiatives, mentoring and coaching, providing links with new professional support units, and also provide a start well lead. Um, it's a main part of the pro I mean the main part of the process for reviewing and approving job descriptions for new consultants in different specialties, ensuring a set standard is achieved. So we have uh, regional advisors and uh, uh, professionals who will examine and review the job descriptions to make sure that they go with the college, uh, they, that they are approved by the college in different specialties in forensics, all the adults, adult psychiatry, uh, yeah, and all major specialties. We also provide supportive networking opportunities for members and provide useful resources via the website and the divisional page. Each div division has its own page on the college website. Provide learning events, conferences, and workshops to target CPD activities, and also opportunity for team working like college roles, EC uh, executive committee members to help and develop a sense of cohesion and identity within the division and raise the voice of psychiatry. Assist with application for co uh, college posts as well. Providing support and advice to continue to develop a meaningful career and provide useful strategic documents based on the national and international best practice in psychiatry. Uh, we have links with the PSS, the Psychiatry Support Service, and this is the email if you want to contact the PSS if you have any specific need or asking for advice at times of difficulties or challenges. We have links with, with the regional uh, schools of psychiatry and the deaneries, and we make sure that new consultants are actively represented on key committees. We also provide opportunities to enhance leadership and management skills getting through getting involved with college roles, which we uh, I alluded to earlier. Regional advisors who represent the college locally on postgraduate uh, educational matters and professional development is also part of the division. 
Um, I know we will have a discussion about mentoring in more detail, but usually mentoring opportunities uh, are available within your division, and you could always email mentoring at rcsite.ac.uk to be guided to the uh, regional mentoring or divisional mentoring lead. So why we bother uh, arranging mentoring? There is good evidence that uh, better mentoring provides better and safer doctors, better patient satisfaction surveys, and better service provision. And these are the key roles of mentoring. And this is the GROW mentoring model, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Building report, professional development, in engage with mentoring and coaching. As I said, if you want more information, please email mentoring at rcsite.ac.uk. And finally, these are the contact details for the divisional manager, Karen Morgan, and also for the Southeastern Division and my personal email. And feel free to get in touch. And thank you very much for your listening. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Altair. Our next speaker in this module is Professor Nandini Chakraborty, who is the Associate Dean for Equivalence at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Professor Chakraborty also sits on the College Education and Training Committee and National Advisory Committees. She will be offering us insight and clarity today into the different trajectories en route to becoming a consultant, specifically the CCT and the CESR. We are very grateful to have Professor Chakrabarti with us today. Over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Nandini Chakraborty, Associate Dean for Equivalence in the Royal College of Psychiatrists since 2016, coming to the end of my term in five years in October 2021. It's a pleasure to be talking to you all today about a comparison of pathways to the specialist register in psychiatry. Congratulations on having made that journey yourselves. If you are attending this webinar, you are on the specialist register or very close to it. But I want to talk to you a bit more about the different pathways to the specialist register and what that means for the people you supervise, train and mentor as you are an educator yourself now. I'll start my presentation now. Okay. So let's compare the two pathways, the two main pathways to the specialist register with the General Medical Council. The two qualifications given by GMC in the UK are CESAR and CCT. Most of you would have gone to the specialist register through the journey of a CCT, the most well-known and traditional training pathway, which in psychiatry entails three years of co-training, as we know, passing your MRC psych exams, and then going on to three years of higher training, or longer if you have taken time out of training or done a dual qualification. However, many senior clinicians will also take the CESAR route, the Certificate of Eligibility for Specialist Registration. This is a one-time portfolio presentation to the GMC to prove that one has attained the higher curricular competencies in psychiatry. However, you might be asking yourself, since I am on the specialist register, why do I have to know about CESAR now? And again, stressing on the reasons, I think that substantive consultants have a duty to understand both pathways if they are to be holistic educators with a view to guiding doctors, both in training and non-training jobs to progress. And there are advantages in knowing the CESAR route for your own career progress. Both routes have their advantages and disadvantages. 
there is no right or wrong for what is um, in it for every individual psychiatrist. It all depends on very personalized circumstances. Many of you will also be taking up clinical leadership roles, become clinical directors, medical directors, and I think it's absolutely crucial to know about CSER and CCT for workforce planning. You will benefit by knowing what is best for your entire workforce, both for the training and non-training grades. So the highlights of my presentation are, I'm going to give you a basic overview, a comparison between the CSER and CCT routes. Talk about what CSER can mean for a psychiatrist already with the CCT in terms of career progression. How can you help a supervisee decide which is the pathway for them? And can psychiatrists use a combination of CSER and CCT for career development? Can you have both? And the answer is yes. So again, coming back to CCT, now that you've completed it, most of you have completed it, look back at what helped you achieve a CCT. So this is a three years in core training, three years in higher training with the MRC psych in between journey, and it's dependent on an annual review of competencies progression, the ARCPs. And the ARCP outcomes are decided on an e-portfolio. They are mainly based on the educational and clinical supervisor reports, workplace-based assessments, the ARCP panel will have a look at whether the candidate, whether the trainee has done audits, research, psychotherapy, has had some management experience, but a lot of attaining the CCT is dependent on what senior educators tell an ARCP panel about the trainee. So the decisions are taken by local educators the clinical supervisor, the educational supervisor, the TPD, the head of school, finally the ARCP panel. The decision at the end of ST6, the outcome six is passed on to the Royal College of Psychiatrists who then recommend the trainee to GMC who then give the qualification. The qualification is given by GMC within 12 months of completion of training. So in the entire process, a trainee is known locally, is observed directly, and there is face-to-face -face supervision and mentoring training throughout the process. So it's not a process where people take a decision about the candidate based on a one-time portfolio. It's a continuous process. On the other hand, for CESA, this is a portfolio that the candidate has to present directly to the GMC. It's still about the competencies outlined in the specialist curriculum. If they do not have an MRC psych, they also have to give evidence of having completed the core competencies, the core curriculum, and all the evidence has to be within the last five to six chronological years. GMC does not consider older evidence as is it, it is not considered relevant and up to date. The way I like comparing CSER and CCT is it's somewhat giving the same syllabus to a group of students and then asking one set of students to do perhaps short questions or MCQs annually for three years Whereas to another group, you give the same syllabus and ask them to do an essay writing exam at the end of three years. Ultimately, the knowledge base, the competencies are exactly the same. The level of expertise you are looking for is the same. The base of knowledge is the same, but the way and the timeline by which you are testing these candidates is different. So there are similarities. They are both based on the special specialty curricula. 
In both routes, there are experienced consultants, either educators in the local scheme, in the deanery, within the trust, who are giving, um, the, giving their decision, or CSER evaluators on the equivalence committee on the college, who I'm going to talk to you a bit more in detail in the later slides. But ultimately, it is these senior consultants, educators who are giving a decision, but they are giving the decision in different ways. Ultimately, we are making a decision about whether a trainee or a SAS doctor or a psychiatrist in any point of their career has attained the capability to become a consultant, to become somebody who is fit to be on the specialist register for psychiatry in the GMC, on the specialist register. But whereas on a CCT, we are heavily relying on somebody else's opinion on whether the doctor has attained these competencies, the way we judge Caesar is on a very different process, which is based on primary evidence. So the doctor gives evidence of their actual clinical work on which somebody can base a decision, even though they've not seen the doctor in actual clinical practice. So as I want you to know about the Caesar process and where you can get involved, as a consultant, as a senior educator now. Let me show you this graph very, very briefly. Now, I'm not going to talk too much in detail about the process from where the application is received by the GMC up to the point where it is sent to the college. Your involvement, if you become a Caesar evaluator, will be more within this period, the 49 days between which we receive an application from GMC, an evidence bundle from GMC, to when the evaluation is sent back to GMC with our signatures. And then the GMC do another quality check before the candidate is given a decision. So from the time the candidate receives a letter saying, yes, your application is complete and has now gone to the Royal College of Psychiatrists, for their views, for their opinion. From that point, they should be getting a decision within three months. And here we have two committees involved. So you have the equivalence committee of the college involved in this phase, and you have the specialist registrations team within GMC involved in the rest of the pathway. So let's talk about these two committees a bit now. So the specialist applications team in the GMC are our closest colleagues in GMC when we do CESA work, or actually they are the one-stop shop, the one-stop journey into the specialist register. They are the people, they are the GMC colleagues who deal with CCT, CESA, and, CZ, and CEGPR. That is, they are the team who look at all applications into the specialist register or the GP register, whatever be the route. They also deal with appeals, complaints. So in a sense, the CESA process is owned by the GMC. The college comes in as an advisory role. However, the specialist applications team or the GMC is most likely to take the advice of the college as the experts in the specialty when we think that the application bundle shows the competencies of a consultant and we recommend the person, the candidate to get a Caesar. GMC is of course going to listen to us over there. We work very closely. And let's talk a bit more about the equivalence committee of the college. And this is a committee that anyone, a, a consultant can join within, um, after a year of specialist registration, after they have um, taken up a consultant job, whether it's in the NHS or in the private sector. And this is the committee that I chair as Associate Dean for Equivalence. 
It is made up of consultants from different psychiatry specialties from all over the country. When we get a portfolio, an evidence bundle from GMC, our training and CESA coordinator, Elizabeth Boxall at the moment in the college, sends out an appeal, uh, sends out a request to our body of evaluators asking at least two people to take up a single portfolio. So every single CESAR application is looked at by at least two evaluators within the equivalence committee. The two evaluators look at these portfolio bundles independently without conferring with each other so that every candidate gets two independent robust opinions. Once the evaluators have done their templates, they have done their detailed reports going through the portfolio about whether competencies have been met or not, they send their templates, their reports back to Elizabeth Liz Boxer again, and Liz then compiles what is known as a variance report. So the variance report shows where the evaluators have not agreed with each other on any particular competency on any particular intended learning outcome as we would call them ILOs in the current curriculum. Once the variance report has been compiled, then the evaluators discuss their opinions and come to a consensus about whether the candidate has failed or passed every intended learning outcome, every competency. If they cannot agree amongst themselves, then the associate dean for equivalence takes a final decision. Finally, the report is signed off and sent back to the GMC. So this is where the networking comes in. If you take up the role of an evaluator within the equivalence committee, what you will be doing throughout the year very actively is taking up these evaluations, talking to your colleagues throughout the year, networking, having those really interesting complex discussions about why a candidate has fulfilled or not fulfilled the curriculum. This is an activity within the college which keeps you on your toes regarding the curriculum within the uh, about the higher specialist curricula and keeps you absolutely within the detail. I think the Caesar evaluators on a daily basis read through the curriculum in detail in order to do their job more than we would have to do if we were only educational and clinical supervisors within an ARCP process. I truly believe in that. And I can also share that being on the equivalence committee since 2012, when I started as an evaluator, and in all these years, um, coming up to five years as associate dean, there are absolute fine details within the curriculum, which I would not have noticed if I hadn't been doing this job. More about the equivalence committee. We meet twice a year. Uh, we do insist that people come to at least one of the equivalence committee meetings, and it's not just a committee meeting. We do a refresher training with the meeting every time we meet. We discuss contentious evaluations. We invite our GMC colleagues to give us some training. We arrange for equality diversity training once in three years through the committee. It's an absolutely vibrant, interesting um, committee. And when we meet, we have some really, really thorough discussions. And I couldn't emphasize more about the excellent networking that you have with colleagues throughout the country on an ongoing basis. Um, reiterating again, you can join after you have been a consultant for at least a year after specialist registration. But if you are interested in simply watching the work of the equivalence committee about observing before you take 
a decision about joining, you are very welcome to email us and we would happily invite you to one of the equivalence committee meetings or training sessions. You can shadow an evaluation if you wish to. We can help you and facilitate that process as well. And uh, there are many ways to get involved with college work, and this is one of the ways it is rewarding. It's educative. It makes you a better supervisor at the end of the day. As I said that there have been things in the curriculum I would not have noticed otherwise, and I think from the bottom of my heart, it has made me a better training program director when I was one in general adult psychiatry. It's made me a better supervisor and actually negotiate those special interest sessions, those special opportunities that trainees need in order to achieve the curriculum hand on heart faithfully. There are lots of things that trainees go through by rote without actually thinking whether they are achieving the curriculum or not. But we have an excellent set of curricula. They're, they are even getting better with the new curriculum work. And being part of the equivalence committee helps you appreciate that to its maximum. I want to talk briefly about what a Caesar portfolio looks like and introduce the concepts of primary evidence and secondary evidence. My favorite and the absolute core of what differentiates a CCT portfolio from a Caesar portfolio. So primary evidence is the evidence that speaks for itself. So this is a set of evidence which does not directly tell you whether a doctor is a good doctor or a bad doctor or a doctor with or without consultant competencies. It is the evidence that helps you make up your mind for yourself about the doctor. Whereas secondary evidence is somebody else telling you about the doctor. Now, what happens sometimes uh, when we've seen very well-meaning consultants trying to mentor SAS doctors to go on a CESA journey is that they do lots of workplace-based assessments for them and they almost replicate what is a trainee portfolio because they do not have the idea of what a CESA portfolio should look like. But actually, a CESAR portfolio is very dependent on primary evidence, whereas an ARCP portfolio is very dependent on secondary evidence. And if you are mentoring somebody for CESAR, you've got to make sure that their portfolio has lots of primary evidence. So what are the examples of primary evidence? anonymized clinical letters, tribunal reports, medical legal reports, minutes of meetings where they have taken a proactive part, they've taken responsibility, they've chaired, they've taken up action points, not just minutes of meetings where the candidate has attended and shown a presence. Psychotherapy summaries, not just a SAPE, not just a psychotherapy ACE or a supervisor report, we actually ask to see a brief summary, some detail of what happened in the sessions, how many sessions, what was discussed, what was the outcome. We want to have a look at their actual teaching slides, the thought which went behind designing a training session, a teaching session, the feedback forms, Primary evidence is also about triangulation. So what we tell CESAR candidates is sometimes a piece of evidence does not stand much on its own, but when you combine it with other evidence, it tells a story. So if somebody gave me just their teaching slides without the context, who was it delivered to? Why was it delivered? How did the candidate get involved in the teaching? Without that context, the teaching slides don't mean much. But if I could have the correspondence that led them to be involved in this teaching, if they gave me a reflection of why they thought this mode of teaching was the best way, whether it was a lecture, whether it was a workshop, whether it was um, <clears throat> a simulated 
um, a role player uh, session, whether it was through a one to one discussion. So giving us that thought and then giving us the teaching material and the feedback that together gives us a story. That is what we call triangulated evidence, and that's what we want to see in a Caesar portfolio. Whereas secondary evidence is references, testimonials, appraisals, workplace based assessments, and they are still important. A 360 degree appraisal, which is up to date, can still tick off a lot of boxes, but we want to see more primary evidence, and that is um, an art almost that we gain the more we do Caesar work, we, we gain the understanding of what kind of primary evidence can show curricular competencies in order to guide people along that journey. And actually, we also think about our own appraisals in a different way. We have often reflected, discussed within the equivalence committee that we get more um, sharp in evidencing our own day to day work for our appraisal records, not just dependent on what our line managers write about us or just thank you cards or testimonials. It is a real art to identify primary evidence which substantiates your work and is not dependent simply on somebody else talking about you. If you have done the work, you generate the evidence, you store the evidence, and it's always a great way to keep records for the future for yourself. So I think this is pretty clear by now that when we are helping people to build a CESA portfolio, the competencies where primary evidence is key is obviously the clinical competencies, history taking, examination, formulation, diagnosis, clinical management, risk assessment, psychotherapy. Whereas secondary evidence could perhaps suffice for more of the domain three competencies, leadership, team working, time management, communication. I would also like to share with you this guidance, which is available on the Royal College of Psychiatrists website on our CSER page. This was a guidance written for NHS trusts and for clinical leaders and managers wanting to support SAS doctors to apply for CESA. There are lots of schemes, fellowship schemes, CESA schemes named differently in different trusts, which aim to support the right doctors to the specialist register through CESA. This is a guidance on how it should be done. It's not about replicating a training program for SAS doctors with a replication of ARCP panels for them. It's got to be done differently. And this guidance is for anyone wanting to join one of these schemes, a SAS doctor, to make sure that they are getting the support that they are being promised and for trusts and clinical leaders to make sure that they are delivering what they wholeheartedly mean to deliver. So again, coming back to yourself, what is there in Caesar other than joining the equivalence committee, which I've talked about? Have you thought about whether you would like considering Caesar in another specialty? And often we have been getting queries from consultants who have a CCT or a Caesar in one specialty and are considering applying for another because they have the expertise. We have general adult uh, CCTs working in forensic settings, in learning disability settings. We have um, people working in subspecialties which do not have a CCT, for example, neuropsychiatry. So these are what we call non CCT Caesars. They have their specific um, requirements to be able to apply, but it is definitely worth considering that if you have a qualification, a CCT or Caesar in one specialty, which is your right to specialist registration at the moment, but you are gaining the expertise in another specialty because of where you're working 
in future, would you like to consider a Caesar application for yourself? And you are within the rules to do that, and we would be happy to guide you through it if you are interested. So in summary, going back to my highlights, I would say in Caesar and CCT, they are both robust methods and they are both equal qualifications on the GMC register. They both have equal career opportunities in the UK. For a psychiatrist already on the specialist register, you have the opportunity to join the equivalence committee or consider Caesar in another specialty. You can help a supervisee decide which is the right pathway for them. Sometimes there are personal circumstances which can make a training rotation difficult for a psychiatrist and on a personal case by case basis, if you know both pathways, you can be that excellent supervisor who helps them choose objectively with a clear view of the advantages and disadvantages of each route. And psychiatrists can, of course, use a combination of Caesar and CCT for career development. I hope to see at least some of you interested with the equivalence committee. Do email us and keep in touch. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Professor. The final speaker of the first module is Professor J. S. Bamra, whose illustrious career achievements are impossible to list within this brief introduction, but are included in the pack, and I would encourage you to go through them. We are fortunate to have him share his experience as a former medical director and offer his, his thoughts on effective ways for new consultants to engage with employing trusts. His talk is titled, What Would a Trust Want from a New Consultant from the Viewpoint of a Medical Director? So good morning, folks. Um, uh, this is uh, J.S. Bamra, as you will know from the intro. And um, before I start, I want to thank Dr. Shadow Deepak, uh, Dr. Hassan and Altair, and Karen Morgan for this um, opportunity to talk to you, to talk to the, the Southeast RC Psych uh, Division. Uh, I believe that this is your start work program, so it looks very exciting indeed. So my task, as Hassan and told me, was to say what I think, well, shall we say the ramblings of an old psychiatrist, what a trust wants from a consultant psychiatrist. So, of course, this comes with, um, some experience as a long-standing consultant psychiatrist, but also as a former medical director of Manchester Mental Health Trust. So um, conflicts of interest, I've got none to declare other than, of course, I'm a fellow of the college, chair of Papio, and I play certain roles in the BMA as well. Um, so I thought, first of all, I'd set up what are, what is a, what are desirable attributes of anyone, but particularly consultant psychiatrists. And these slides will be uh, will be in parts at least uh, uh, illustrated with some some uh, some cartoons as well, which is specially done for me. So I've got domain of six or but rather nine, forgetting my maths, nine attributes that I think are very important uh, for psychiatrists. Uh, and, and actually, when we start a job, it's very important to get the right tone of what we are about, as well as understanding what other people around are about. So uh, it's a great, exciting time. To tell you the truth, uh, although we have long training, 30 to 15 years with some of us, um, most of us at least 13 years, really nothing, nothing trains you to become a consultant psychiatrist. We've got a fantastic training program here in the UK through the Royal College of Psychiatrists and Health Education England. But actually, you know, when you become a consultant, it's a whole different world. It's very important to make that start in the correct manner, as I said. So these are the desirable attitude, attributes, I think. Hopefully we've got, everybody's got all of these. Um, so equal respect, everyone matters. Everyone matters equally. 
And of course, everyone may not be the same and they may not be treated the same, but actually everybody does matter. And in days of equality, which is quite significant, um, all the stuff about bullying, harassment and discrimination that is going on, that is a particularly important principle to bear in mind always. Individual respect is important. Keep people informed, give people the chance to express their views. This is not just patients, but people around you, because you are now in a very responsible position. Respect people's personal choices. Minimize harm, uh, reduce disability, minimize disruption, learn what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and I'll come to that afterwards as well, because that is a core part of what a consultant psychiatrist does. Fairness, of course. People with equal chance of benefiting should have equal chance of receiving, working together. It's so important. It's something that all of you will do very well, which is work in a multidisciplinary team, but also support each other. You know, be the leader. You are the medical leader of the team. Depends on which team you're in. But, you know, I mean, I always go for this, that I am the medical leader of the team. Uh, and some people shy away from that. But I think it's very important that you are able to exercise what you've been trained for, which is to become that person with the best medical expertise in the team. Take responsibility for your behavior, share information appropriately. And of course, there should be reciprocity. Those who take on increased burdens should be supported in doing so, particularly when you take on lead roles for the trust as a clinical director or a medical director, deputy medical director, but also other lead roles that you might take within the college, the BMA and other organizations. Keep things in proportion. Information communicated must be proportionate to the risks. Restriction on rights must be proportionate to the goals. And flexibility is so important. You need to know where to be flexible, uh, to be truthful. Plans must be adapted to changing circumstances. I think people, in my experience, who get into difficulty are people who are completely inflexible. Uh, and and so get into difficulty with, with teams as well as patients to be truthful. And openness and transparency, that kind of candor is so important. Good decisions will be as inclusive, transparent and evidence-based as you can possibly make them to be. But of course, the scope of responsibility is quite extensive and I shall illustrate that with six uh, particular domains. So in terms of your individual uh, responsibility, ethical practice at all times, of course, working within the boundaries of good medical practice and other regulatory frameworks with, within the law, human rights, mental health act, CPC, all that sort of thing. Keeping up with CPD, appraisal, revalidation, legislation, promoting trust and NHS values, so important to the trust uh, management team. And of course, we have a wider role, as get, particularly as we get more experience, as we get out and about, is about public health, working across boundaries. We are the best people to tell people about how to prevent mental illness, in my view. And often in public health, prevention of mental illness doesn't figure at all. And to be able to do that, to be able to prevent stigma, these are so important, and you're in a good position to be able to do that. Ensuring your services are aligned to any national or regional strategies, such as suicide prevention, again, so important. But again, increasingly, the world has shrunk. And so in time to come, you will each have some part to play in global mental health, which again, in my estimation, doesn't get enough space. But of course, as we've seen with the pandemic, people talk about the physical issues with the pandemic, but there is a another pandemic coming head over heels of this, which is the mental illness or mental poor mental health pandemic. And we should be in a good place to be able to signpost this uh, to trust and wherever we go uh, in terms of raising awareness. And of course, reduction of disparities isn't just local, particularly mental health disparities, because you will know that, for instance, patients with severe psychosis they uh, they die 15 to 20 years before their time, before people in the general population. So global health can be measured as a function of various global diseases and their prevalence in the world. 
and the threat to decreasing life expectancy in the present day. And the other duties that I've scanned for you are research and teaching. I've lumped them together, but of course they are separate, but they are very interrelated. Developing drugs, many of you will go on to doing a lot of research in uh, pharmacology and other therapies, and we should be developing them uh, so that uh, we promote those that are effective, putting patients before profit, producing honest, transparent data. And there's many a researcher, including in psychiatry, who's gone into difficulty because they have not. Uh, produced honest, transparent data. Teaching and lecturing is really your everyday portfolio. You're teaching all the time. Think yourself as a teacher every day of your working life. Sharing data, sharing good audit, knowledge across the, uh, across the borders, all crucial to your, uh, your uh, contributions to the NHS and the trust. And of course, your core work is going to be your clinical work, making good use of scarce resource, trainees, SAS, LED doctors. And of course, as you grow in, in, in stature and become a senior manager, consultants, nurses, beds, all that sort of thing, they are so important. The consultant should have a good overview of resources, including expensive drugs as well, of course. Giving precedence to certain patients, for example, urgent cases, complex patients. One of the biggest problems that I've seen lately is the access to psychiatrists. I'm afraid I'm going to say something controversial here, but uh, uh, the CMHT has become a barrier to accessing psychiatrists. Uh, and one of the difficulties is that, uh, is that uh, patients do not have access to that medical expertise that many of them so rightly want. So be aware of that access gateway, whatever your uh, local uh, local uh, um, uh, expertise, uh, lo uh, the local systems are, to be aware that uh, look, we need to make sure that the right patients get to the right. And of course, in the modern day world, sorry, take it back, in the modern day world, of course, technology is so important. Being familiar with apps that are fit for purpose, using data ethically. I know there are lots of them, but just to be familiar, and there's, we need to be sharing that resource. The trust will help you. The NHS will help you with that as well. The college also has, uh, has um, some advice on that. Um, and so using social media now, the GMC keeps updating this guidance because, again, we are in a very social media world, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, we have to use them responsibility. And I know of a consultant particularly who uh, for no particular reason fell foul of the trust because of something that they had said on WhatsApp, which to my mind was just a, not a, a little OTT by the trust, but also to be aware of these issues is very important. Being aware of misinformation across internet and social media, your patients will come to you with rooms and rooms of information that they've got from blogs and other places. And to be able to have that dialogue with them, you need to be better informed of what's going on in the in, on the internet, social media, and that sort of thing. So now what might this EU, of course, is the ultimate boss of, uh, of all trusts, employees what would the ceo expect from us i think it's very important to know when you get appointed uh, and as you work your way into the trust is it's really important to know what does the management board constitute you know not just the ceo and the medical director or the nursing director but also the finance director non-executive directors often consultants don't take much interest in these things, but they are the people who run the trust and it's very important for you to be able to have uh, 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 dialogues uh, with the appropriate person on this. So I, of course, I've set this out as I saw it as in my experience from my CEOs, what would they, what might they want from, from doctors who work in their trust? Well, understand the mission and values of the trust. You'd be surprised how many doctors, consultants do not know what the mission and the value of the trust is. And every trust 
has those clearly stated, so remember them. Those are the guiding principles by which the trust operates. Participate in governance. I think most of you will do that anyway, but be aware that you've got to keep up with your training, all the mandatory training, particularly governance is really important. And be fully up to date with the direction of travel of the trust. Be available for informal or in, informal advice, including to the person right at the top, which is the chief executive officer. Treat patients and colleagues with respect, and I will come to that again in a, in a bit. And as I've emphasized before, I think it is our job as consultants to be able to use resources appropriately, to be aware that it's uh, that uh, money in the NHS is in short supply and that it's not a bottomless pit. And of course, as we come out of, of our training, we often are not aware of these things. It's really important. Some of you will do management courses and management diplomas, which I think hold you in good stead. I certainly did one when I became a consultant management in the NHS, and it's really held me in good stead. So it's very important to be aware of that. It's outside of the uh, out scope of your clinical duties, but it is still relevant. And what the CEO wants is that you are a good spokesperson for the trust. Believe in me, as a consultant psychiatrist, even though you may not be out and about as often as the medical director or some other medical team members will be, people will be aware of your existence because you are a scarce resource in yourself and therefore certainly your local area will know about who the consultant psychiatrist is. If they don't, then make sure that that happens. And of course, again, as you grow in stature, collaboration becomes key. Collaborate with external agencies where required, your PCNs, your CCGs, ICSs, as they take form, will become more and more significant. Be aware of what's going on there. Uh, be the spokesperson you need to be there if necessary. And of course, roles for the Royal College of Psychiatrists and other organizations, all very important. And absolutely to be aware that you have to be constantly uh, updating your declaration of interest to your trust. They have a register of, uh, of this. Well, what, what would I as MD expect from a consultant? Well, uh, fortunately, uh, consultants can train to practice at the highest level uh, in the NHS. Uh, and so it's a really good start. But there are key things that uh, sometimes people don't do, you know. Um, remember that everybody is as the, as the cartoon here demonstrates, you know, we must remember that we are in the same boat. And of course, we must, uh, we must absolutely respect everybody. Uh, everybody will have different expertise, but they're of equal stature within Within the trust, every employee is extremely important. It does not matter whether you're a consultant, a nurse, a staff grade doctor, junior doctor, a porter, they're all very important people to the trust. So that's what, as MT, I would expect that we treat everybody with equal respect. And this was often as I was a medical staff chair for a number of years as well, in the trust that I worked at. And consultants have a different kind of buy-in. A medical management meeting is really important in terms of not only your participation in medical decisions, in terms of strategy and other things, but also in terms of giving a right, the right signal to everybody, including senior management, that consultants and other medics are working together for patients ultimately this is for patients. So work with your medical colleagues on medical priorities. Develop your MDT. So locally within your team, you would develop your MDT. Innovate. Think about something new. You know, that brings always brings vigor to your team. Bring in research, bring in teaching sessions regularly. Uh, all that keeps everybody's, everybody's interest alive. And of course, prevents burnout, as you will know, as being uh, an expert on mental uh, mental health and seek new pathways of care. Look at audit, improving or improve on your practice. You know, do your local audits. Your trainees will be very interested in doing this and it's very good experience for them. 
So look at how you might improve pathways of care, because as I mentioned before, one of uh, one of my certainly uh, well maybe criticism, maybe take it in the in the right manner, but access to patients is a real issue in the NHS, particularly mental health services. So be aware of that. What can you do to make people or uh, patients access the right care at the right place? And hugely important, participate in serious incident reviews. Many of you, if not all of you, will be aware of Datix. We know that a higher number of low-level Datix makes the trust safer so that you have lesser, fewer, serious, very serious incidents if you have low level datix, uh, low level risks uh, at the trust. And I found this to be a problem because, you know, obviously consultants have very busy jobs and I, I try to factor in serious incident reviews into people's job plans as much as possible. So it's very important. This all comes as part of your SPA. Uh, and I think I think it's very important for yourself as well as well as for the trust. Uh, certainly, as medical director, I valued very much uh, consultants being part of this review because your your expertise here informs how we deal with uh, with uh, issues of harm. Ensure compliance with coroner's inquest. Of course, we have to. But um, it's very important to be able to ensure that you take an active interest when you're called out to the coroner's inquest. And, and the trust will give you legal representation, but I always say to consultants, SAS, LED doctors and junior doctors, ensure that you are separately indemnified. There is a bit of a conflict there that the trust has to look after the trust interest. And so make sure that you're also indemnified by the appropriate medical um, insurance organization, whatever that might be. So please make sure that you do that, I would say separately. Deal with patient complaints in good time. Now, this is the biggest issue. Consultants often working very hard, but not being able to look at patient complaints. And I think um, uh, I, I did develop the knack of knowing, well, I've made that patient a little unhappy now. What have I done? It might be nothing that I've done, actually, but it might be in the perception of the patient that I've not listened to them, that I've said something insensitive to them, which I didn't mean to. A good, a sorry in good time is a very good idea. You know, the GMC will tell you this as well, in good medical practice. Apologizing does not make you, uh, uh, make you responsible for something that might be a bad outcome for them. Uh, but it is important to be able to recognize that. And, and of course, you know, patient complaints take up a significant amount of your work because there'll be lots of paperwork uh, and meetings and all that sort of thing. So deal with patient complaints in good, good time. And as medical director, obviously, I would say that I would want uh, medics to enjoy their work. Keep up morale. I think you're in a very good place to keep up morale and spirits of trainees as well as managers, your MDT, and do it with a bit of humor if that is appropriate and if that is possible. And you don't have to be leashman to be a good psychiatrist, you know, I think, but it is important that, you know, as a good psychiatrist that we keep up with our clinical skills, but to understand what is it that gives patient satisfaction and what it is. This is a little survey done by two consultants in Pakistan. Uh, I thought it's very relevant in the National Health Service as well. So letting the patient talk about their condition, discussing treatment options, and for the doctor to make the final decision on the medical part of the treatment, providing symptomatic relief, telling the patient a bit about their illness or as much as possible about the illness, giving them leaflets, signposting them to something that might be on the net. These are the most important things, particularly the former three. Talking, patients talking about their condition, treatment options, doctors making that decision about treating them, but giving them uh, some kind of hope, some kind of symptomatic relief, all very important in patient satisfaction. And of course, as a trust medical director, I would really welcome 
consultants being better informed about what uh, is what it is that gives the patient a good feeling about their journey through mental health services within the trust. Etiquette always important wherever you go. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're with a patient or in an MTT, in a management meeting, whatever, wherever you are, it's very important, but certainly for patients, it's very important that uh, you have eye contact with the patient. There's nothing worse than walking into a room and not uh, making any eye contact, uh, uh, not getting any eye contact from the doctor. And to, in today's uh, day and age, gone are the days, you know, when I trained, you know, the doctor knew the knew best. Well, that's not the case. It wasn't the case then, but we were none the wiser. We are wiser now. It has to be a good partnership with the patient. Communication is key. And I've been writing letters to patients. I co copy every patient into my letter to the GP. And I've been doing this for nearly two decades. It's very important to be able to communicate uh, with the patient. Um, and the letter serves a purpose because patients often, you give them so much information that they get, go away confused about what you've said, about their diagnosis, about their treatment. So copying letters to patients wherever possible actually helps you. And it actually perversely also helps your complaints, you know, because uh, you, know, you, you will hardly get any complaints. Patients feel that time is very important. Sometimes we are very rushed in our clinic because there are so many things going on, but it's very important to give that allocated time to patients. Otherwise, they feel aggrieved that they came with all their, uh, they, they, they wanted to, to give you everything in their history that they wanted to give or their relatives might want to give, and the doctor was either not interested or couldn't spend enough time because they're so preoccupied with other pressures. So remember that and appointments, of course, definitely on the day, try and see the patient uh, as soon as possible after the appointed time, but also be aware of access to treatment, access to the psychiatrist, uh, and also about what's happening with your waiting list. I, I found that uh, psychiatrists often give a little slip, give it to the reception or the secretary to say, see me in four weeks, and it turns out that patient doesn't get an appointment for three months or even sometimes at worst case scenario, six months because your workload is so heavy. So just remember all of those things. It's very important. But patients, you know, they don't, uh, their fundamental expectations are really quite basic. Um, what they want is a, is, a, is, a, is a nice, pleasant doctor rather than us being too clever. And there are two fundamental domains. The relationship with the doctor, you know, uh, the doctor understanding multicultures these days, you know, it's very important. Shared decision making, communication skills, as I mentioned, continuity of care. Patients dislike turning up and finding that, look, I've seen a different doctor today. Next time they will see a different doctor. And sometimes they go through a whole, uh, uh, you know, that, that treatment seeing so many different doctors. Uh, and I know that with the short uh, the shortcomings of, of the LHS with the workforce, this is sometimes unavoidable, but minimize as far as possible, as far as you can. That's very important. And of course, for patients, outcomes are very important, you know, for them to understand what is going to happen to me now I've had a psychotic illness. You're in the best place to offer that. And of course, as medical director, your expertise to the patient is, is hugely important to me, or former medical director, I should say. Well, this is all a balancing act, isn't it? What is your individual aspiration and what the trust objectives are? But when you look at it, you can tilt the balance so that there is equilibrium. I'm absolutely certain that you will do that. So, uh, so good luck. And finally, a little bit of humor, as I said, helps. You know, um, I can give you a little anecdote, you know, that um, once I went to deliver a lecture uh, in the sticks and uh, I waited for 10 minutes and there was one other person. So I thought better get started. 
I gave my lecture. Uh, I thought I was the most uh, the most the, the most prolific lecturer of all time, of course. And I gave my lecture, and um, I said to this person, "Well, thank you so much for sitting through that half an hour." Uh, and he said, "Well, I'm the second speaker in the slot." So, uh, so a little bit of humor always helps where it's appropriate. Uh, but good luck. I think you are a great asset to the NHS and to the trust, and I'm sure you will do very well. All the best. And my thanks, of course, to Thomas Duval, the French artist, who helped me with these cartoons that you've seen uh, across my little presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bambra. We have now reached the end of the first module. I hope that you enjoyed the session so far and you'll join us for the rest of the modules. Please do send us any questions or comments that you have for the speakers and remember to complete the feedback form. Thank you.